Teresa Mead. I teach Latin American history at Union College, and I'm very pleased to be here tonight um, to introduce a speaker at the James Connolly Forum. Um, the, uh, the person that we're having tonight is a, a someone who I was very pleased to meet today because I have heard of him uh, over the years. He's an extremely well-known uh, political scientist, I've written a great number of books on Latin America. And um, in that, very interesting because he does not live in the United States. And sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. But, but uh, those of you who maybe, US, the United States is a rather parochial place. <laughs> And U.S. academia is even more parochial. Um, you know, we just read the people that write here, you know, whatever. They, they write other places we don't pay attention to. Um, so uh, it's, uh, Steve Elner has made a, uh, has a very strong academic career. And his work is very well known uh, in populism and political parties in Latin America. Um, his book uh, publications include, um, there's a whole number of them here, um, but the one that I remember well is Organized Labor in Venezuela, 1958 to 1991, um, Behavior and Concerns in a democratic setting. Um, he's also written a lot about the Latin American left, um, and he has written on uh, rethinking Venezuelan politics. His um, work is also well known in a, a more popular medium. Uh, he has published in the New York Times, in the Los Angeles Times, as well as in The Nation. And he's a regular com contributor to a journal called NACLA, the North American Congress on Latin America, uh, which puts out a NACLA report on the Americas. Um, he, uh, we were talking earlier today about a special issue that he is co-editing on, uh, that's coming out with a journal called Latin American Perspectives, and it's on the Latin American left in power. And um, we might talk about that a little later in terms of the Latin American left and the Latin American left in power and also some of the distinctions between some of the various um, governments uh, on left and left and left of center governments in Latin America today. Um, he earned his, um, Steve is originally from Connecticut, I learned, but he earned his PhD in Latin American history at the University of New Mexico. Uh, in 1980. However, since 1977, he has taught economic history and political science at a number of universities in uh, Venezuela, particularly the Universidad de Oriente in Puerto, Las, Puerto La Cruz. Um, and he taught there uh, for 10 years and also, um, no, he taught for 10 years at the Universidad Central de Venezuela. Right now, he's, on, he's uh, um, emeritus from there, has uh, retired, but he has been teaching in the Misión Sucre, or, uh, which is a special government program in Argentina, which, um, Argentina, in Venezuela, which uh, is for uh, students from the barrio, or from the uh, lower classes, um, who get a degree at the university level. He has been a visiting professor at a number of universities here in the United States and as well as in other places in Latin America. Um, so I think that we're going to be in for a very special treat tonight because he has lived in Venezuela for a long time. He writes a great deal about Venezuela, knows a, a lot about it, and it is a country that is most recently in the news because of the re-election of um, Hugo Chavez. It's very um, charismatic leader. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Steve Elman. Thank you, Teresa, and I want to thank the, uh, John and the other people who in invited me to give this, this talk, which I think is very opportune. The uh, Venezuelan election, presidential elections occurred uh, a little over a week ago. And so I think this is a, a really stellar moment in order to analyze events in Venezuela um, and to, in addition to analyze events in Venezuela and ask the, the, the fundamental question, how is it that uh, Hugo Chavez, after 14 years in power, is able to win another election, um, his fourth election, or actually his fifth, his fifth election, uh, since he first uh, came to office in 1998, he was elected first in 1998, came to office in 1999. 
Um, so that's a fundamental question that uh, I'd like to deal with. But in addition to that, I think that it's a, a, a moment to reflect on, if not expose, the misconceptions in the United States and the sources of those misconceptions with regard to Venezuelan developments. Um, because this is a particular moment in which there is a big discrepancy between the reporting on Venezuela prior to those elections on October 7th, Sunday of last week, uh, two weeks ago, and the results. Uh, prior to those elections, many people felt that Chavez was not going to win, that the main rival, uh, Enrique Capiles, had uh, the better chance of, of winning those elections. Um, and one uh, pollster in particular was cited widely in the media, in the United States, uh, in Venezuela, uh, and also uh, I was interviewed um, by uh, Radio Beijing or Chinese English speaking radio uh, station. It, I couldn't have done it in Chinese. Um, and uh, this pollster was referred to uh, as indicating that uh, Capiles was probably going to win the elections. But the fact of the matter is that the results were really not surprising. Uh, the results in which Chavez won those elections by 11 percentage points, um, that was really not a surprise. Um, and the other event that day, which was also really on people's minds, was how would the re opposition react to those results? And some people felt that the opposition would not accept the results um, if Chavez won. Um, because the obvious question was, if everybody is citing this pollster who indicates that Chavez is going to lose, the results of these elections usually are not much of a surprise. I mean, both sides probably knew what the results were going to be. And so why is it that the opposition, why is it that the media in the United States, why is it that this person who interviewed me from Beijing were all saying just the opposite? Well, Bank of America knew who was going to win. Bank of America um, stated that Chavez was going to win. Um, but the reason why the results were not a surprise to me was not because of Bank of America. I don't trust Bank of America either. <laughs> it was because one pollster who um, is very well known in Venezuela, the polling company is uh, um, Data Analysis, and the head of that company is Vicente, uh, Luis Vicente Leon, who belongs to the opposition. He um, uh, uh, is an opposition person. He gives advice to the opposition. Uh, if you read anything that he says, any analysis of his, you realize that he's anti-Chavez. Anti and yet, his results over the years in these previous elections have been more or less accurate. Unlike this pollster who this Chinese person cited, and which the US media widely cited, and which the media in Venezuela widely cited, which is called uh, Consultores 21, Consultores 21, whose owner, whose head, um, uh, Jose, uh, Jose Antonio Hilietes, said at one point that he hated Chavez. He hated Chavez with a passion. I think he said he wanted to kill Chavez. I don't, I'm not, don't quote me on that, because I'm not sure. But just hearing um, that he wanted, that he hated Chavez was enough to indicate that his results could not be considered particularly objective or reliable. Um, so the results were not surprising because that analysis predicted them. That analysis stated that Chavez was going to get, he talked about three scenarios, and one was 9%, the other was 10%, and the other was 11%. So Chavez got 11%. That was within the range that that analysis predicted. So that wasn't at all surprising. The other big question, which was on people's minds, was how was the opposition 
going to react to those results. And that is um, a complex question because there are people in the opposition uh, who are um, willing to believe anything and uh, would believe anything that the opposition stated. If the opposition stated that there was fraud, they would believe it. Not everybody in the opposition, but a big chunk of that opposition would go along with that. Furthermore, the opposition uh, had a history of claiming fraud going back a ways. In the 2004 recall election, which Chavez won with 59% of the vote, um, the opposition immediately declared fraud, even though Carter was in Venezuela, the Carter Center was observing those results and validated the results. Carter himself, before he returned to the United States, uh, stated that these results were um, accurate. And the OAS as well. And even the Bush administration, at, at one point, I'm not sure when, but even the Bush administration recognized the results of those elections. That's what I read someplace. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the opposition um, really shot itself in the foot when it did that for the simple reason that their people didn't go out and vote the next time around. Uh, that was in, on August 15th, 2004. On October 31st, 2004, there were gubernatorial and municipal elections that were held. And the Chavistas won those elections in all the states in Venezuela except two. Um, and one of the reasons for that, of course, one reason is that there's a euphoria on the part of the Chavez people. Another reason is that the opposition people are demoralized. Um, so they're not going out campaigning for those candidates. And some people want to be with a winner. And if Chavez had just won the elections, well, they figured, you know, I'll vote for the Chavistas. But in addition to that, a large number of members of the opposition didn't vote because if the opposi opposition leaders, all of them, were saying those results were fraudulent, well, why go out and vote? And that's exactly what happened. In the next, uh, the next year, the opposition, at the last moment, decided to boycott the elections. So the opposition lost valuable space. And my prediction, and I hate to say that I was right, but that was the case. My prediction was that Chavez was going to win by more or less that amount, and that the opposition would recognize the results. It seemed obvious to me that they would, because, again, uh, gubernatorial elections are coming up in December, and municipal elections are coming up in, in early next year. So that if the opposition were to claim that fraud was, uh, had taken place, the same thing would happen uh, as what happened in 2004. So the opposition candidate accepted the results. He stated that he accepted the results. Um, and now they are campaigning, the opposition and the Chavistas are campaigning for the December gubernatorial statewide elections. But it, 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 the, the, the media really uh, should be held accountable. I mean, they, they were stating, firstly, that it looked like Caprilis was going to win, even though, according to the reliable pollsters, Chavez was way ahead. Because by US standards, 10%, 11 points, 11 percentage points, that's a big difference. Uh, Obama should be that lucky. Um, and secondly, the opposition was claiming, I'm sorry, the media was claiming, uh, some of the media, some of the articles, uh, emphasized what the New York Times called the fear factor. The fear factor was that the system was not, the electoral system was not reliable, that people were afraid to vote, especially people who worked for the government, uh, that they would, um, that their vote would be uh, determined and they might lose their job. This is what articles, including the New York Times, stated. The New York Times went so far as to quote a second year law student <laughs> whose name uh, I can't remember because it is such an uncommon name. It's like Schwartzen Vagen Vaughn, 
something like that. Um, and she claimed that she was afraid to vote for Caprile. She supported the opposition candidate, but she was afraid to vote for that opposition candidate because the Chavistas would find out who she was voting for, and she would uh, have her professional aspirations blocked as a result of that. So she was going to be voting for Chavez. She stated, she told the New York Times that, uh, you know, uh, and, and my first reaction when I saw that in the New York Times was obviously either the New York Times or this person made up that name, but that wasn't the case. I looked up her name, uh, I Googled her name, and she exists. That is her name. And in addition, in addition to that, um, uh, in her Twitter account, uh, there's a photo of a poster of Capriles, and she's kissing the poster of Capriles. So a person who's that afraid that she's going to vote for a candidate that she doesn't support, uh, she posts on her Twitter account um, that photograph. And on top of that, she tells the New York Times um, uh, <laughs> that she's afraid to vote for Capriles. Uh, it, it's not at all convincing. It's not at all odd that people like that are saying those kinds of things. You hear it all the time. I mean, it's almost Alice in Wonderland, living in Venezuela during an electoral period. Um, but what is really um, uh, surprising, if not outra outrageous, is that the New York Times, uh, uh, did, firstly, didn't use common sense, uh, quoting this woman, and secondly, didn't check her out, uh, as Mark Weisbrot did, um, somebody who, uh, an economist, Washington-based Washington -based economist, pretty well, pretty well known, who checked out her Twitter account. Okay, Chavez wins by 11 percentage points. This is highly uh, uncommon in electoral democratic politics. Uh, in U.S. history, up until the 50s, uh, there were no term limits for presidents. And yet only one president was re-elected more than once. That was Roosevelt, who, was, who died in office. Uh, and was elected four times. Um, and, but keep in mind that he was a wartime president during, at least for one of those elections. But in any case, it's very uncommon. De Gaulle, uh, Churchill, uh, it, it's very uncommon uh, that uh, presidents and heads of states sustain widespread acceptance over such an extended period of time. Um, I believe that in order to understand that phenomenon, uh, you have to analyze Chavismo, what I'll call Chavismo, the Chavista movement, um, two aspects of the Chavista movement, which President Chavez has um, uh, taken into consideration in his decisions and his policies. One aspect is um, the rank and file of that movement. And the bottom-up uh, flow that comes from the rank and file, the pressure that comes from the people, that comes from the vast majority of the people, at least the people who support Chavez. Um, and on the other hand, the bureaucracy, the top-down approach, uh, the people, the ministers, the Chavista governors, uh, there, 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 there are really two factors at play here. And Chavez has succeeded in reconciling, if you want to use that term, these two factors. Uh, one, one of the reasons why Chavez is able to maintain the support, and not only the passive electoral support, but the active support, the enthusiasm, the participation of that rank and file, is that in spite of the problems that exist, and in the course of our discussion, I'll refer to some of the concrete problems. In spite of the problems that exist, inflation uh, being one of them, crime being another, there is the sensation that this process of change is not stagnating, that there is a deepening of the process of change or a radicalization. And the rank and file 
uh, has a sensation that um, in spite of all these problems, there's progress. Things are moving along. Um, just examining these 14 years, uh, that's quite evident. Chavez was elected in 1998, and his main interest, his main his discourse, uh, and most of his energy was directed at the constitutional um, promise of drafting a new constitution. That happened in 1999. So that in the first two years or th three years of his government, let's say the first two and a half years, um, the reforms that were incorporated in the constitution of 1999 uh, were the most important aspect of his government. Um, political reforms, not socioeconomic ones. Um, uh, in terms of human rights, in terms of uh, uh, restructuring Congress, for instance, there was uh, previously Congress was a two-chamber Congress and it became a National Assembly. And a number of reforms um, which were designed to encourage participation in the decision-making process, but they were political reforms, not economic ones. In 2001, Chavez uh, signed a law that encompassed really 49 laws. Uh, they, it was emergency legislation. And these were anti-neoliberal reforms. So that the first stage uh, went into the second stage, which was an anti-neoliberal stage, uh, an agrarian reform. And perhaps the most important reform of them all was the oil Reform. It was called the Ley Organica de Hidrocarburos, in which um, the state uh, uh, was assigned more than 50% ownership of all mixed companies in, uh, involved in the primary acti oil activity. So that companies that were being privatized, mixed companies in which the state had less than 50%, in the 1990s. The oil was nationalized originally in 76, but in the 90s, uh, under the influence of neoliberalism, uh, mixed companies were established. And those mixed companies contained majority foreign capital. That changed in 2001, and shortly after that, Chavez was overthrown. So a second stage you can call an anti-neoliberal stage. A third stage, Chavez takes advantage of the momentum of his victories, after he was overthrown, he came back two days later, 40, 48 hours later. Then there was a general strike that lasted two months. Um, and then the referendum, the recall election, which he won with what I said before, 59% of the vote. So Chavez takes advantage of each triumph in order to deepen the process or radicalize the process of change in Venezuela. And in 2005, Chavez defines himself as socialist and redefines the concept of private property as meaning rights. That was incorporated in the Constitution of 1999. Property owners have rights. But now Chavez is saying they also have obligations. If they don't feel those obligations, they run the risk of losing that property. And in 2005, Chavez expropriated companies that had shut down, uh, that were not functioning, and had not paid the workers their severance payment. Um, and so basically, Chavez in 2005 was implementing this new policy of uh, redefining private property. Um, uh, so this next stage can be considered more of an economic stage. Um, and then if, uh, uh, after he was reelected president in 2006, uh, Chavez expropriated or nationalized uh, strategic sectors of the economy. Uh, uh, the telecommunications industry, which incidentally was owned by Verizon. Uh, the steel industry, which had originally been public, which had originally been a state company going back to the 50s and 60s, was privatized in 97, was renationalized in 2007. Cement, which was owned by Cemex of Mexico, was taken over. Uh, electricity companies were taken over. So basic industry was taken over. That's moving the process of change along further, which incidentally in Venezuela should not have been considered that radical 
because the political parties in Venezuela supported the concept of state control of basic industry, what, what the Constitution of 1961 calls basic industry, or strategic sectors of the economy, the pro-establishment political parties always supported, or since the 60s, supported this idea that the state should control the strategic sectors of the economy. Well, that's exactly what uh, Chavez was doing. He was renationalizing some of these strategic sectors that had been privatized in the 90s. Uh, and in other cases, in the case of cement, it had never been state run, but it was emblematic because the owner was uh, what you might call the Rockefeller of Venezuela, Eugenio Mendoza, who was considered the, the most important capitalist in Venezuela since the 40s. Uh, and that was, after he died, that was brought up by the Japanese and then brought up by, the, by, by Semex. So that a number of these strategic companies were taken over in a further step towards uh, deepening the process of change. So what I'm trying to say is that one of the reasons why the rank and file, uh, just when some of them feel that the problems are so great that they start questioning whether it's worth it all, uh, Chavez comes along and he surprises people um, with uh, uh, things like this, um, specifically with regard to steel. Steel was uh, nationalized in 2008. And it was nationalized at a time in which the Steel Workers Union, which historically is the most militant, perhaps, union in Venezuela, the most militant and strongest union in Venezuela, going back to the 70s, uh, was confronting the foreign-owned consortium that controlled the steel company, that bought the steel company in 1997. Um, the, uh, there were um, clashes over the renegotiation or the negotiation of, the, of a new collective bargaining agreement that went on for a year and a half. And at one point, there were bloody confrontations. There were some people were killed in the streets. Uh, and the governor of the state where the steel company is located, which is an industrial, very industrial, heavy industrial state, the state of Bolivar in the region which is known as the Guayana region, the governor was really supporting the consortium. And the Minister of Labor also supported the company against the workers. The workers really felt they didn't have any allies, politically at least. Um, and at that moment, Chavez surprised everybody and declared the nationalization of Sidor, of the state, of the steel company. And at the same time, he replaced the labor minister with um, somebody who showed a certain amount of support for the, for the steel workers. He was a member of the Communist Party. He had just left the Communist Party to join the Chavez Party. Roberto Hernandez was his name. And uh, so the workers rightly felt that this was a victory for them. And this is an example of the dynamic that I'm referring to here, that the key to Chavez's political success and the dynamic which explains these 14 years of rule, of a balance of sort, or an attempted conciliation of these two factors, the bureaucracy, that run things, that get out the vote, that have a sense of organization, but the rank and file that is naturally essential for the process because Chavez and the Chavistas not only depend on their vote, they depend on their active participation in this process. The more recent decision, and again, the, these, these decisions that Chavez makes um, are surprises. <coughs> Uh, firstly, and secondly, the decisions that favor the rank and file and sometimes represent a slap in the face of the bureaucracy, of the bureaucrats. Um, for five or six years, there has been, um, there was negotiation in the National Assembly over a new labor law. The labor law went back to 1990. Actually, it was an improvement. It was an improvement. It was a, even though 1990 
1989 marked the beginning of the neoliberal period. Um, the uh, ex-president of Venezuela, Caldera, uh, who wanted to be re-elected um, president and was re-elected president in 1993, drafted a, a pretty pro-labor uh, piece of legislation. Uh, then he was elected president as an anti-neoliberal, and then he became a, a hardened neoliberal. Um, that wasn't the first time that that happened in Venezuela or in Latin America. Fujimori, Menem, the list goes on and on. But in any case, the Chavistas argued that this labor law had to be reformed. And it's, at one point, they decided it had to be changed completely. And so uh, discussion took place in the National Assembly that went on for you know five or six years. And then uh, in November of last year, Chavez announced that instead of passing this legislation in Congress, where obviously there were different viewpoints about the legislation, and obviously within the Chavez movement, although this was never made public, this never was discussed publicly, but sectors of the Chavez, Chavista movement were opposed to uh, certain worker banners and the reason why that legislation was not passed was that um, there was opposition to these worker banners, pro-worker banners, from within Chavismo. And so Chavez decided to marginalize the National Assembly and set up a commission because there was legislation that allowed him to enact emergency legislation. It was about ready to expire. Um, and so he announced that this commission was going to design a new labor law, and he would sign it prior to May 1st. And that's exactly what he did. The labor law was drafted. There were very interesting uh, benefits to the working class um, as a result of this legislation. And on the eve of May Day, in fact, the day before May Day, Chavez signed into law this legislation. One of the worker benefits was something that the Chavistas were actually implementing in different state companies, but was subject to considerable controversy and, and, and conflict. And that was the uh, elimination of outsourcing. In other words, a system in which the company that um, uh, was engaging in ongoing, certain ongoing activity, they would uh, have a smaller company uh, carry out that activity, and the smaller company would have a contract. Um, and so in that way, the larger company, the matrix company, would not have to pay the workers certain benefits. Or if there was a contract that was a pretty advanced contract for the workers of that bigger company, well, that way they could get around. Of course, everybody knows how that happens. That happens here in the United States. But here in the United States, when you talk about outsourcing, um, we were talking about that last night. The uh, implication is that it goes abroad. But in the case of it doesn't have to necessarily go abroad. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that it is a way of getting around uh, worker benefits that have been incorporated into collective bargaining agreements. Um, so when the companies were expropriated in 2007 and 2008, but one of the things that Chavez announced was that there would be an incorporation into the payroll of those companies, the workers who were uh, carrying out ongoing activity. In other words, in the oil industry, if it was a project <coughs> that would terminate at a given date, well, those workers couldn't be absorbed by the state oil company. But if it was an ongoing kind of activity, and especially activity that was related directly to the business of that company, uh, then those workers would be incorporated into the um, company. And the company, the smaller companies, the companies that get the contracts, would be out of business. The labor law uh, outlaws out outsourcing, defined as I just have, within three years. Within three years, outsourcing will be completely eliminated, both in the private and the public sector. So that's one very important piece of legislation um, or part of the legislation that was um, drafted and approved of. The second is 
a system of severance payment. And this is something that's extremely important in Venezuela. We don't really attach that much importance to it because our system is more based on unemployment compensation. That system exists in theory, but not in practice in Venezuela and much of Latin America. Much of Latin America uh, has a system of severance payment. Um, when I first arrived uh, to Venezuela to do research for my dissertation on organized labor, uh, I had problem translating <laughs> some of these terms, uh, severance payment and other terms that are related to severance payment, because the concept, uh, those concepts really didn't exist in the States. But I realized that the severance payment system is very much a part. It's perhaps the most important piece of la labor legislation or the most important benefit for the workers. That's what they talked about. Um, uh, liquidar las prestaciones sociales, if anybody knows Spanish. That, 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 those, those, ter those terms got thrown around all the time. That means uh, when a worker gets his or her severance payment prior to leaving the company. And, and that, that's exactly the system that was set up uh, under the influence of neoliberalism. In 1997, uh, the Caldera administration, incidentally Caldera was the one that drafted the severance payment system back in 1936. Mm -hmm. He was 20 years old. He was going to be minister of the, uh, minister of labor, but he's too young. He had to be 21 to be minister <laughs> of labor. So, but he was co-author of the labor law of 1936 and co-author of the succeeding labor law, not co-author, author, of the labor law of 1990. The same Caldera, uh, with the support of all the political parties, the pro-establishment political parties, and the movement towards socialism, which by then was really not socialist at all, um, drafted legislation. And the labor movement participated in the drafting of that labor legislation. There was a tripartite, tripartite commission of government representation, business representation, and labor representation. Labor participated in the drafting of that legislation that eliminated the system in which you get paid um, on the basis of your last salary. And in an inflationary situation, an infl inflationary country, and Venezuela had inflation at 102% the previous year, 1996. Inflation was at over 100%. So how else can you do it? It's the only way you can pay those workers. Because if you pay them on the basis of the salary that they're getting each year, within five or six years, what they got the first year really isn't worth anything. Um, and in effect, that legislation meant the way it worked out in practice, the workers got paid their severance payment at the end of every year. Now that really eliminates the very concept of severance payment. In fact, the term severance payment is a misnomer because they're getting paid on a yearly basis, for the most part, not, not completely, but in some cases 70%, in other cases 100%. So it, when Chavez was running for president, um, and that legislation was drafted in June of 1997, Chavez uh, and, and all the, the establishment, pro-establishment labor leaders supported that legislation. Uh, Chavez opposed it, and that's, one of the reasons why he was elected, one of many reasons why he was elected in 1998. Um, so when that legislation was discussed in Congress, the more moderate, what I'll call moderate sector, the Chavista movement, obviously was not willing to re-implement that system in which the worker gets paid his or her severance payment on the basis of their last salary. But that was a Chavista banner. I mean, Chavez raised that banner back in 1997. So it was a very delicate, sensitive issue. And Chavez got around that by naming this commission, this presidential commission on labor legislation, uh, and signing the, the, the law, going around uh, Congress to, to, to draft that legislation and pass it. Um, and there were other aspects of the legislation which was very important. but. Uh, the work week was reduced from 44 hours to 40 hours. Um, prenatal, no, postnatal uh, leave of absence was increased from 12 weeks to 20 weeks, uh, and a number of other important uh, but more concrete benefits. Um, so I, I think that when we talk about 
Chavez's political success, we have to go beyond discourse. That's what a lot of the academics, and that's what a lot of the political commentators on both sides do. They concentrate on Chavez's style, they concentrate on um, uh, the language that he uses, and everything else. But I argue that you really can't understand discourse, especially when you're talking about a time span of 14 years, uh, if you don't relate the discourse to concrete actions. Uh, and Chavez's uh, political success is due to the fact that uh, he takes the side of the rank and file in these show-offs, uh, show the, 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 these confrontations between um, the rank and file and the so-called bureaucracy. I don't really like using the term bureaucracy, but it gets thrown around a lot. Uh, in Venezuela, the, some of the Chavi, Chavista and some of the leftist analysts in Venezuela and throughout Latin America use the term uh, the constituted power and the constituent power. The constituent power is the rank and file. The constituted power is the bureaucracy, the political bosses, uh, and the people in power. The party bosses and, and the ministers, etc. And so some of the analysts, for instance, we're talking about uh, uh, Alan Woods, who's a um, an English Trotskyist who um, served as somewhat of an advisor to Chavez. Uh, I haven't seen his name recently, but um, for a period of time he was pretty influential in Venezuela. And in his writings, he talked about these two powers. And um, the constituted power, in his words, was counter-revolutionary. Um, I would say that it's much more complex than that. And what Chavez has done has been to um, rely on both of those factors, the bottom-up and the top-down, the constituted power and the constituent power. Um, th there is uh, th 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 that relationship between this top-down power, the statist power, and the bottom-up power uh, can be applied to foreign policy as well, uh, which Chavez uh, has done. Um, uh, He's appealed to the people throughout Latin America. He's very popular throughout Latin America. He's also very controversial. A lot of people hate him, a lot of people love him. But just to give an example of how that strategy was implemented with regard to foreign policy, in 2005, um, the Summit of the Americas um, took place in Mar del Plata in, in Argentina. And there, the FTAA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, was buried. Bush at first, in fact Clinton at first talked about implementing the free trade area of the Americas that was first proposed under Clinton um, at the Quebec Summit of the Americas uh, in uh, I think 2000, I think, I think it was two, the year 2000. Uh, and all along they were saying within so many years uh, that the Summit of the Americas, the, FTAA was going to be implemented. I think 2005 was, was the year that it was supposed to be implemented. Well, that was a deadline for the implementation of the FTAA. And Chavez went to Mar del Plata and he spoke at a mass rally at a stadium um, with Maradona and a number of, of um, uh, Argentines. And then from the stadium, from this mass rally, he goes to the summit. Uh, and he proposes that uh, the FTAA be discarded. It was a real slap in the face for, for Bush, who attended that, somebody of the Americas. Um, uh, but Chavez and, and, the, and the proposal that the FTAA be discarded uh, what what am. Um, but this is an example of combining uh, an appeal to the people, an appeal to um, the organized, the mobilization of the people, and also dealing with he heads of state, uh, because those presidents at Mar del Plata um, sided with the position that the FTAA was not beneficial uh, and should be more or less permanently discarded. After that, the United States pursued bilateral agreements with different countries, such as Colombia,
Peru, uh, and now South Korea. Um, but uh, more recently, I think my, my, my feel is that this strategy of appealing to the rank and file, but at the same time recognizing that the bureaucracy is indispensable, at least at this moment, that Venezuela is not ready for a shakeup of the bureaucracy. It's not ready for a cultural revolution. It's not ready for a term that Chavez used earlier on, which is revolution and the revolution. That was a term that was, I think, Regis de Bray coined that term or used it um, back in the 60s, uh, which means uh, uh, you know, a radicalization from within and chopping heads and um, getting rid of dead wood and, and, and uh, privileging the more radical elements within the movement and getting rid of the more conservative or moderate elements within the movement. And Chavez used that term. In fact, I heard him at a rally in the city of Cumaná. That was maybe back in 2003 or so. Um, he used a term. We need a, you know, he, he, he used that term. Revolución dentro de la revolución. Uh, he's not using that term now. And my sense is that uh, Chavez is continuing with this dual strategy, but that there's evidence that he's giving greater emphasis to the top-down approach. One example of that is his uh, very friendly relations with the president of Colombia, um, uh, Juan Manuel Santos. Uh, Santos ran for president. The previous president, Uribe, had very stormy relations with Chavez, uh, ups and downs, but at the end, really quite um, uh, uh, conflictive. And it looked like uh, Santos was going to be worse. He had been the Minister of Defense under Uribe. But uh, Chavez used the issue of commerce between Venezuela and Colombia, which is very important for Colombia, not so much for Venezuela. Venezuela is doing most of the importing. And Venezuela demonstrated that it could go elsewhere, and it was going elsewhere. It was going to the south, southern uh, cone, South American countries. Um, and Santos and many sectors, conservative sectors in Colombia, uh, wanted to make peace with Chavez. Um, but this has had important ramifications uh, in international politics and Colombian politics. For instance, um, uh, Santos is now, has now locked horns with Uribe. Uribe represents a rightist uh, tendency within Colombian politics. He met with members of the Venezuelan opposition during the campaign. He attacks Chavez uh, whenever he has an opportunity to do so, whereas Santos has very friendly relations with, uh, with Chavez. Um, and so there's a, a bifurcation of establishment politics in Colombia, partly a result of uh, what Chavez has done, um, partly a result of um, Chavez's um, um, uh, reconciliation with, with Santos. Uh, so that has had an important effect in Colombian politics, but also internationally, because the international organizations in Latin America that have been created over the last uh, seven or eight years have had a big impact on hemispheric relations. Uh, first, UNASUR, which, took in, which takes in the South American countries, and the head of UNASUR, I think the president of UNASUR, is a Venezuelan, Ali Rodriguez, um, is now uh, Secretary General. I think the previous one was in, was in Ecuador. I think um, Correa was the headed UNASUR for a while. But in any case, um, at the recent Summit of the Americas, uh, I, I interviewed uh, uh, some diplomats uh, uh, in the United States about the um, Summit of the Americas for an article that I was working on for, the, for NACLA. And I was told by the Bolivian ambassador to the United Nations that 
the positions that UNASUR and CELAC, which is, which is similar to UNASUR, but it takes in all of Latin America, it excludes the United States, but it takes in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. So it's a much broader alliance. And it was established in Caracas in December of last year. Uh, that these positions serve as scripts, serves as, uh, um, as a guide for the diplomats of the different Latin American countries. And it takes in more than just the more leftist countries like uh, Bolivia and Ecuador and Venezuela and Nicaragua. And it goes beyond the more moderate countries like uh, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, and includes Colombia as well, and Chile as well, which is really reactionary. Um, so this unification tendency based on alliances and based on understandings and based on Chavez's concept, which was a status concept from the very beginning. The Chavez announced from the very beginning, in 1999, or maybe even during the, the campaign prior to that, in which he used the term multipolar world. And he stated that what this world needs is a multipolar world. It really was a euphemism for anti-imperialism. Basically, he was saying there's a, a, a una, singular polar world. Uh, the United States controls the world, and that's not good. Uh, and so different poles have to be created, like OPEC is one pole, South America is another pole, the European Union is another pole. So these different poles will serve to balance uh, each one out. Uh, and that's what he proposed as far back as 1999. And that's what he has been promoting in Latin America through a status strategy of alliances and understandings with different countries. But alliances in any situation implies concessions. Uh, when you negotiate, you have to make concessions. And this has meant concessions on the part of Venezuela, which many Venezuelan leftists, many of Chavez's followers, are opposed to uh, or critical of. Um, for instance, uh, with regard to Colombia. Chavez's position when he came to power and the president of Colombia was Pastrana, who was a fairly um, uh, a peaceful president who was trying to uh, promote negotiations with the guerrillas. And Chavez's position was that Venezuela wants to play a constructive role in promoting and furthering those negotiations. And uh, the United States was trying to get Venezuela terrorist organization. But what he stated was, if I do that, I cannot broker an agreement. Uh, I cannot play conciliator. Um, and so uh, I am going to play a neutral position in really what is a civil war going on in Colombia. And Venezuela, with the exception of the Colombians, the Venezuelans are paying a very, the highest price of, of anybody uh, because the civil war spills over to Venezuelan territory. Venezuelans get kidnapped. Um, and um, uh, as a result, uh, it's in the Venezuelan government and the interest of the Venezuelan people uh, to promote an agreement. So from the very beginning, Chavez's position was that the FARC was not a terrorist organization. Um, and that his main interest, uh, Chavez's main interest, was in promoting an agreement to put an end to this uh, virtually endless fighting that has been going on in, in Colombia, at least since the 50s, if not since the 19th century. Um, uh, because Colombian violence really goes back in time. Uh, about a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, a sympathizer of the FARC, who may have been a member of the FARC, but was a, a Colombian-Swedish citizen. He had left Colombia uh, to go to Sweden a long time ago, perhaps 15 years ago, and may have acted as a representative, um, but was considered more of a journalist. He might have been doing PR work for the FARC more than anything else, uh, by the name of Joaquin Perez. Returned to Colombia vis-a-vis Venezuela. And there's really a setup because 
um, the, the Venezuelan government was notified that this guy was on the plane heading to Caracas, the airport outside of Caracas uh, in Micatilla. Uh, and uh, so Chavez was in a difficult position. If he were to accept this guy uh, in Venezuelan territory, uh, certainly his relations with Santos and Venezuela's relations with Colombia would uh, suffer as a result. Uh, he turned over. He arrested, had uh, Joaquin Perez arrested, and he turned him over to Colombian authorities. And Joaquin Perez is presently in jail in, in Colombia. A lot of Chavistas that I know of, that I, I've spoken to, uh, not, not, not all of them, uh, but a lot of them, uh, feel that that was uh, uh, unjust, that Chavez should not have done that. Um, because the guy could not have been guaranteed a, a fair trial in Colombia. Um, I personally uh, feel that way myself. I think that Chavez should have just, you know, had him return to, to Europe. Uh, but I mentioned this example to indicate that there aren't really any easy way out. I mean, these issues are complex. Um, and these strategies really involve concessions um, and uh, this is exactly what's taking place in Venezuela. What's that? Okay. Um, just. Um, okay. So just to, you know, I can, I can go on and on. Um, uh, but I'll try to, to be brief and to uh, make my last point. And that is that <clears throat> the uh, Probably the, 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 this dual strategy that I referred to uh, will continue for some time. Uh, but my feeling is that there's evidence that Chavez is get, giving greater emphasis to the um, state managers and the state companies um, and the ministers as opposed to the rank and file. Um, to give you an example, of the one area which I particularly am very critical of, and if I had the opportunity to talk to Chavez, uh, if Chavez asked me for one piece of advice, uh, <laughs> this is what I tell him, that the party, Chavez's party, should be a mechanism for that rank and file to channel its criticisms, its beliefs, its, its um, positions in upward in an upward direction. Originally, the party, when it was created in 2007, was a mass-based party. It was based on a massive number of cells called uh, battalions and then patrols. Um, uh, but over a period of several years, uh, that party has really become an appendage of the, uh, of the state. The vice presidents of the party, Chavez is the president, the vice presidents or ministers, or in one case, the president of the National Assembly, an important Chavez leader who's running for, uh, who's going to run for governor uh, of one of the states. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. But in any case, uh, at the state level, the party is run by the Chavista governors. At the city level, the party is run by the Chavista mayors. So you don't have really an autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the state. Uh, that I consider to be uh, uh, a major critical area. Uh, and I believe that, uh, oh, what I was saying before, that uh, the impression that I have is that things are moving in the direction of more of a top-down approach than vice versa. Although I certainly don't think that this process is coming to a halt, that the process of change is not going to continue 
or that the rank and file is going to be ignored. I certainly don't want to say that, but I just want to place things in a relative context. And um, one of the reasons why I reached this conclusion is that up until 2010, and including 2010, the party held internal primaries. That was the most encouraging aspect of the Chavista parties. The, the, the PSUV, which is the party, and its pre the, the, the previous party, which was the MVR, I'm sorry, the MVR. Um, uh, they held primaries uh, to elect their party, party authority, authority uh, uh, at one point, primaries to elect their, uh, their candidates for city council, uh, to elect delegates to the National Congress of their party, to elect the candidates, uh, the gubernatorial candidates in 2008, to elect the candidates for the National Assembly in 2010. So they, they were holding internal primaries. The opposition didn't. The opposition, um, uh, the, the, the leaders of the, the party bourses chose the opposition candidates. Now, in these elections in 2012, it's the other way around. Um, Capriles was elected in elections, in primaries that were held to choose the, their candidate. And although it wouldn't have made any sense for Chavez to have run um, in internal elections, because obviously he was going to be the candidate, um, but in the gubernatorial elections, those candidates were just announced. And they were announced, uh, they were appointed by the national leadership of the Chavista movement, by Chavez himself. So. I think things are moving in the wrong direction in that respect. Um, but I do believe that this idea of a revolution in the revolution, this idea that the, um, the masses know better, uh, I am not, I'm not saying that facetiously, because very often they do. <laughs> and I can mm -hmm. provide you a, a number of examples that demonstrate that. But it's not always, the, it's not that simple. And um, Chavez needs that so-called bureaucracy. Um, it, when there is an electoral process, um, the uh, Chavisa governors and the Chavisa mayors and the, uh, the state structure is, is important, is an important instrument for mobilization. Uh, the, that Chavista bureaucracy is what jump-started the um, community council movement that I haven't talked about, but is really uh, one of the most important aspects of the Chavista phenomenon, the community councils, the 30,000 estimated councils that exist in the communities throughout Venezuela. Well, these community councils were uh, established as a result of these bureaucrats who went into the communities and said, look, we now have money for public works projects but the only way to get that money is to form a community council. So to say that it's all bottom up is really misleading. Um, it's a much more complex process. And that's really what I'd like to end on, the complexity of uh, what Chavez is calling 21st century socialism. Um, I think that if we're honest intellectually, we have to say, that there are a lot of things we feel very sure about. When it comes to the opposition, when it comes to capitalism, when it comes to imperialism, we're pretty sure of ourselves, and for good reason. But when it comes to socialist construction uh, in a democracy, firstly, we don't have any blueprint, because we don't have any precedent. Uh, 20th century socialism was not democratic in the sense that you didn't have elections, and you didn't have a multi-party system, and you didn't have freedom of uh, the media. So this is really a novel experience. Um, but I believe that this experience in Venezuela is demonstrating uh, that the enthusiasm of the rank and file, the uh, invigoration of that rank and file, is a basic element, uh, is indispensable in this process of social construction. That's probably what did the Soviet Union in. You didn't have any kind, anything similar to that in the Soviet Union. Um, so that element is fundamental. Uh, but there's another element that I think is also fundamental that nobody talks about. And one of the things that I disliked about Woods when he spoke, when I heard him speak, 
was that he didn't refer to this. He talked about expro mass expropriations, but he didn't talk about the subjective factor. It's not easy to define. It's not easy to find where people at. How far can we go on the basis of uh, people's consciousness, people's ability uh, to not only support this process, but also organize themselves to play a role in this process? Because it's not just about uh, sympathy for the process, it's also about discipline and organization. And that subjective element has to be analyzed. I don't have any um, measuring rod to say, well, the Venezuelan people are at this stage and I can quantify that subjective element, but it's an issue that has to be dealt with. Thank you. answer that on an empirical level, because mm -hmm. I don't have the statistics. Mm -hmm. um, I can just give you a sense mm -hmm. on the basis of living in Venezuela and having lived in Venezuela since 1975. Um, in 1975, I was a student, I had to walk around Caracas at nighttime. Uh, I'd walk my future wife home, and she lived in a not too good area of Caracas, and then I'd walk back to my place sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, didn't have any feel of fear on the streets. Um, that situation changed in the 80s. I started getting pickpocketed in the 80s when I went into Caracas, and then it got worse in the 90s. So it has gotten steadily worse, okay? That's point number one, and there's no question about that. The second point, which I think there's no question about either, is that the issue has been politicized by the opposition. Uh, any, anything that you read in the U.S. media on Venezuela is going to mention that. Um, in addition to that, the opposition does something all the time, which I think is dishonest. They conflate the issue of lack of security on the street and the issue of human rights. And they make it seem as if, you know, everybody's the, the fear factor. Uh, you got to be afraid of for your life. And that somehow is associated with persecu political persecution. And they're, firstly, they're two, di two completely different topics. And secondly, in my mind, the opposition has nothing to complain about with regard to the political persecution. Um, another point. Um, uh, the the um, degree of violence uh, and insecurity uh, is exaggerated, and I see that all the time. Nevertheless, sometimes I feel like saying you can't exaggerate the insecurity because it's, it's, there's no question about it. I mean, I can't say that I see it, but I hear directly, I mean, firsthand, so somebody who has had experience, well, I've also had uh, experiences in terms of two cars getting robbed, but one of them was prior to Chavez. The other, yeah, the, the first one was prior to Chavez. But, um, uh, you know, you, you hear about these incidences, people that you know, people who aren't necessarily, I, you know, when somebody who is vehemently anti-Chavez tells me anything, I, I take it with a grain of salt. But when somebody who is not necessarily anti-Chavez and somebody who's pro-Chavez tells me something, well, I believe them. And so, on that basis, I can say that there is a serious problem. Um, I've, I've had uh, students and professors ask me for advice in fact, Miguel Tinker Salas is a student of his, um, asked me to write a statement about that because there were two or three students who wanted to go to Venezuela to do a study in Venezuela and wanted to know my opinion about that problem. And I thought about it and I said, I, I, I'm really afraid to say anything because if I tell them what I'm telling everybody here and anything were to happen, 
uh, I could be held responsible, even though I'm not saying that the situation uh, is innocuous. But anything that you say that is less than alarmist uh, could backfire in that sense, or could boomerang. So I didn't want to really, you know, make any kind of statement in that in, in those cases. So it's it's complex, it's complicated, and I don't really have a hold on on quantifying it to say that it's um, uh, just how serious a problem is. Uh, but the perception, but you know, I, I saw one study that indicated, and this is why I say that you don't really know who to turn to for information. A study of a re very reliable source uh, that indicated um, that a comparative study of Latin America that showed that the correlation between perception and actual fact, that Venezuela ranked much higher perception-wise than fact right? comparing Venezuela with the rest of Latin America. In other words, the people tend to overstate the problem in comparison to other countries in Latin America. Oh, okay, uh, well, hold on. Okay, I'll start over here, and then here, yeah? And then there, and there, okay? And you back there. Uh, I wonder to what degree uh, Hugo Chavez has been able to uh, retract Venezuela from the global capital, <coughs> because it seems like it's a near impossible task. Uh, and then, if that has not been the case, how much he's a prisoner right. in the sense of, of global capital, whatever his intentions might be. Right. Um, you know, th there. I didn't talk about workers' control in Venezuela, but it, it's a, a big movement for to promote worker participation in the decision making of companies, specifically state companies, although also private sector. And one of the arguments of the more radical sectors of the Chavista movement of the left in Venezuela is that if you don't have workers' control, which Chavez supported in theory and did some very interesting things in favor of, uh, but then over the last year or so has backtracked on, um, then these state companies, it was a step in the right direction, but they're going to be uh, uh, examples of state capitalism. Uh, you're going to have state capitalism in Venezuela. I personally don't like the term state capitalism. I think it's it's misleading um, because I. But I, I won't go into that. But I'll just say that uh, it seems to me that the state sector forms part of the world. Economy, uh, the steel industry, the aluminum industry, naturally, you're exporting products. Um, but these state companies are also uh, implementing certain policies that are not cost benefit effective. Um, policies that favor the workers and policies that favor the communities. Um, so that, uh, just to give an example, uh, companies that provide, um, the, the, the paper company that was expropriated in 2005, it's called Vinapal, and it was expropriated when Chavez redefined the term private property. And th they, they sell uh, notebooks for students uh, at, at very low prices, and they say that a certain percentage of their production uh, is production for solidarity purposes. Uh, so that kids can buy notebooks. And I see them, I see them. They, they're selling for um, uh, very, very cheap prices. Uh, 10, 10 believe it is, when the private ones are going for 60, 70 believe it is. 10 or 15 believe it is. Um, so uh, there really is a mix there. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It, you know, uh, does it have to be either Mao's uh, artaki of um, pulling out of the world economy and becoming self-sufficient or uh, competing at the world level. Is it possible 
to develop um, a more nuanced situation in which there are social goals. Um, and, but there's also an effort to be efficient. How do you guarantee that efficiency uh, if you're outside of the market system or if you're only uh, half inserted in the market? Uh, you know, th th those are issues that are being dealt with in Venezuela. Um, and so I, I don't think it's an either or situation. What you have in Venezuela, even though Chavez talks about socialism all the time, Venezuela is not a socialist country, uh, you have a mixed economy. You have a private sector and you have a state sector that is competing with the private sector in key areas. Food processing is one key area. Uh, distribution is another key area. Um, telephone, <coughs> cell telephone is another area. Um, it's, and, and there are a number of key areas in which you have competition. Um, and the state at the same time that it's competing with the private sector, um, it's also providing benefits for the people. Uh, the banks that have been expropriated, the, the, the banks that have been taken over, uh, provide uh, opportunities for the popular sectors that in the old days couldn't even dream of getting a loan from a private bank. So there's a combination of market considerations and social considerations. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask from contextual stuff, contextual point of view, the question she was asking about violence. We have that here in the States. You have that in just about every single country. But is there any kind of context or you know, does it have to do more with narcotraficantes? Or does it have to do with issues related to poverty? Um, you know, would you say the violence is clustered in more cities and less in towns and where there's communities and things like that? And maybe these aren't questions you can answer, but sometimes it helps for us to understand, um, you know, the bigger picture, why things are the way they are, if there are any answers to you. Yeah, I, I have to confess that I, I don't really have uh, knowledge uh, about that phenomenon. All, all I can say in terms of the wider context is that th this, is, this problem uh, in Venezuela is a Latin American problem. Not so much in the United States. In the United States, we have 2.3 million people in jail <laughs> in, this, in this moment. Um, so we have other mechanisms to deal with the problem. Some people in, you know, you, you tell that to people in, in Venezuela, and you might get a response, oh, that would be great if we could do that here. The problem here is that the judges let them out, uh, you know, after a few days in jail. So, you know, it's a ma matter of value judgment. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it's not just Venezuela. I don't have to talk about Mexico. But, it, but Brazil, for instance. Um, yeah. I was at the, the uh, LASA Congress in Rio, and there uh, the executives go to work not in limousines, but in helicopter. So, uh, and in Mexico, they, they live out of, out of the country. They fly from the border uh, deep into Mexico, into oil areas such as uh, Villa Hermosa, which is uh, to the south in Mexico. Um, but they have their families out of the country and they go there, I guess, over the weekend. Judy? Mm -hmm. Joe? Um, a couple things. One is, uh, you talked about how he nationalized, I think you said the steel industry and the cement and uh, oil and some other industries. Well, but how does that work? Do they mm -hmm. buy off the industry and do they keep the management structure? And how, how does that work? That's one question. And I don't know if you have time for both of these. But the other one is, do you think the CIA is involved trying to uh, make sure that socialism doesn't take hold? Okay. Okay. With go to the first country. First question. Um, the uh, you could say that the oil industry was. Chavez says that he renationalized the oil industry. I wouldn't say that because the state oil company PDVSA, uh, you know, goes back to the nationalization, the original nationalization, in 1976. But there was a process of gradual privatization. That was the intention uh, of the. Uh, important sectors, including the, the executives of the oil industry. Um, but the, the uh, companies were bought out, and that, that is a reason why the Venezuelan road to socialism may not be a, a model completely for the rest of Latin America. Venezuela has 
the resources uh, to make those payments, especially when you consider that the price of oil, you know, skyrocketed from uh, less than ten dollars a barrel to over a hundred dollars a barrel. Now Chavez deserves credit for that. If you're Venezuelan, if you're if you're living in the United States, you blame him for that. But Chavez had a lot to do with that uh, within OPEC. He he promoted stabilization at, at higher levels and it continued to increase. Certainly there are a number of factors there. Um, but yeah, the, 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 some of these cases have gone to international arbitration. Uh, Exxon, for instance. Um, but uh, th these, these companies have been expropriated. They haven't been confiscated. Uh, with regard to the CIA, uh, there's just so much evidence that the United States, uh, you know, has been deeply involved. There's a U.S. Venezuelan uh, uh, activist by the name of Ava Goldinger. Uh, she is a lawyer. She studied law in, in New York with my niece at, um, uh, at, at CUNY. Um, and then, but her mother was Venezuelan, or is Venezuelan, I don't know whether she's still alive. Um, she went to Venezuela and she's become a, um, a Chavista. She's in the States now. But she does research and has published several really well-documented books under the Right of Information Act. Um, she gets documents and she, uh, of course, most of the documents are blotted out, but she uses those that aren't blotted out. Just to give you one example, uh, in the 2002 coup, the CIA sent a document to the State Department one week before the coup in which it stated exactly what was going to take place on the day of the coup. It stated that there was going to be a massive demonstration, there's going to be disturbances, there was going to be some shooting, and then there'd be a coup. And that's exactly what happened. And the day after the coup, uh, Ari uh, uh, Flight, uh, Flight Fleischmann, the press secretary of um, uh, Bush, said that Mr. Chavez uh, uh, got his people to fire on innocent protesters. Well, the White House knew what was going to take place, what took place that day. They got the information from the CIA. Um, uh, Otto Reich, who I think was the Undersecretary of State for um, Hemispheric Affairs at that, at that moment, moment um, got on the phone and contacted all the diplomats to try to get other Latin American countries to recognize the de facto government on uh, April uh, 12th, the day after the coup. So obviously there was U.S. involvement, U.S. participation, but there's other evidence uh, of military support. Um, uh, it's kind of piecemeal evidence. So it's really hard to put together the whole story. Um, but there, there is so much evidence of U.S. involvement. Uh, look at, um, prior to these elections, uh, John Joykoechea, no, Joykoechea, Joykoechea is a student leader in Venezuela. He received uh, an award, the Milton Friedman Award from the Cato Institute, uh, uh, the Cato uh, <laughs> Institute, uh, and also got funding from the National Endowment for Democracy and other government. If you want to consider that government, I consider it government. It gets 90% of its funding from the, from the U.S. Congress. Um, and the uh, other organizations that are connected with the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the U.S. government. And he stated that if Chavez did, if, if, if uh, that, that, that Capriles was going to be elected, if he wasn't elected, that the people were going to rise up, there'd be massive, bloody confrontations, mm -hmm. and I quote, God only knows how many people will be in the streets uh, for an indefinite period of time or for a very long period of time. This is a guy that's getting funding from the United States. Uh, and there's just so much evidence to this effect that funding is going in. The um, candidate 
uh, who was ru was running against Capriles, who wanted to be the candidate of the opposition, who was actually much more militant, much more rightist, uh, much more aggressive against Chavez than Capriles, um, and then supported Capriles after he was nominated, um, got her uh, NGO, which was supposedly a you know neutral organization, back in 2004 that declared that there was fraud that was committed in the recall election, uh, her organization got funding from the NED. Uh, that's uh, Sumite. The group is called Sumite. And she was the vice president of that organization. So these key political actors are getting funding from the US government and the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, Bill Robinson, who's a scholar at the University of California at Santa Barbara, um, who's written on Central America, and he's also interested in Venezuela, told me uh, a couple of years ago, that he was really amazed that he uh, he had done some research on uh, CIA type activity in uh, Nicaragua and uh, El Salvador, and he was really amazed that the same names were coming up, you know, in Venezuela. The same people were now involved in Venezuela, so that um, there's just a lot of evidence to that effect. Okay, Joe, you're next, and. Um, you used uh, phrases like uh, Chavez surprised everybody, like with the steel workers yeah. and so forth. And you get the sense sometimes in looking at the situation in Venezuela that it really is just a Chavez show. That there's no organization behind, yeah. that there's no, that he makes decisions and people right. support the decisions. And he does it all on his own. Of course, right. he's a man with breast cancer. Um, and is there an attempt within the Chavez movement to educate? Is there any democratic process that goes on with that, or to educate within the population as a whole? And, uh, uh, is there a way that uh, uh, it's more a, um, a social phenomenon than just a Chavez phenomenon? Yeah. What's going on? Well, well, there are really two questions here. One is education, and I mean, that, there's no question that the government has made a tremendous effort to promote widespread education uh, in the barrios at all levels, cultural levels, um, university, high school, literacy levels, uh, and they've been quite successful on that front um, and incorporated uh, hundreds of thousands of, of young people and old people, people of all ages. Um, but the other part of the question is with regard to this being a one-man show. and. Um, I, I would say two things. One is, I, I think that it's a real weak spot for the Chavista movement, not only because Chavez, you know, Chavez's illness uh, made it quite uh, clear that, uh, you know, what would happen if he passed away, if anything happened to him, uh, that this was an issue that had to be dealt with, but not only because of that, but because um, when you have a more fluid situation at the leadership levels, and especially at the national leadership level, you have debate. You have, at least you have differentiations. And I believe in my study of Venezuelan politics going way, way back, I mean, go, Venezuelan politics, not me going way back, Venezuelan politics going back, <laughs> that situations in which many scholars um, and, and commentators uh, just assume that pro-establishment parties were saying the same thing. More or less what we say here about the Democratic Party and Republican Party, but even more so, because at one point it didn't look like there was any difference between COPE and Acción Democrática in Venezuela. Um, you know, here in the States you can say that there are concrete differences between the, the two major parties. But I, I've always argued that there are always differences, and there are differences in internal elections even though it appears to be a personality con uh, contest. And so I think that uh, it's important for the Chavista movement to be more diverse, not in terms of anybody competing with Chavez, <coughs> but creating a situation in which there'd be a second in command, or there'd be some competition within the Chavista party and within the Chavista movement, so that there'd be more pluralism <coughs> and a differentiation um, and eventually mechanisms in which the rank and file uh, can choose leaders on the basis of specific positions. Now, I don't agree really with the concept, the term one-man show. 
I think it's misleading. Because Chavez is not doing <coughs> what he feels like doing. Um, uh, um, Diana, uh, Diana Raby, who's an English scholar who's written on the Latin American left and uh, has written on Venezuela, uses the term dialectical relationship to describe the relationship between Chavez and the Chavistas, in which there's a communication. She talks about situations which you see often, which Chavez is talking, Chavez communicates a lot with the people. When he's talking uh, and somebody shouts something out, I mean, he's, he's really attent. He's really uh, listening to what people are saying, and he asks them, I, I didn't hear what you said, uh, and there's somewhat of a dialogue, and he responds to the crowd, um, either in individual form or through applause, through shouting, that kind of thing. Um, and so she calls this a dialectical relationship. Look at in these elections that are coming up at the gubernatorial level, under a normal situation, the incumbents would be appointed candidates. Well, in, in a number of states, including my own state where I live, um, there was a lot of sentiment in opposition to the, to the Chavista governor. And in my state, the governor is an important political figure uh, at the national level. He's well known, he's a poet. Uh, the opposition attacked him physically during the coup. They, they grabbed him and they, they hauled him away. So he was somewhat of a, of a hero. Um, and then he became governor of my state. He's been governor for a period of time. And he really wanted to be reelected, or he wanted to be candidate again. But the rank and file was very critical of him. And Chavez chose somebody else. Well, he chose Aristobulo Oisturiz, the ex-mayor of Caracas. So he chose an outsider as a candidate. But what I'm trying to say is that Chavez uh, doesn't uh, make decisions on the base. The, these surprises are surprises uh, in each case, because Chavez is responding to pressure from the rank and file. In the case of the, oil, of this, the steel nationalization, he's responding to pressure from the steel workers <coughs> union that at that point seemed quite isolated, it didn't seem like they had clout. And Chavez uh, accepted their proposal for nationalization. Um, and there are a number of other examples that I could provide of surprising decisions that Chavez um, makes that supports the rank and file. So it's not really a one-man show. An aspect of, of one of the cells, a friend of mine uh, who's a Chavista who belonged to one of the cells uh, invited me and I'd go to the meetings and participate in the meetings. And um, the feeling that everybody had, at least in this particular cell, they, they, at that point it was called a patrol, una patrulla, a patrol. And I feel that everybody had, th this was in 2009, 2010, and they had just held internal elections to choose the delegates to the extraordinary Congress of the party. And the mechanism, the, the, the arrangement was that there'd be a topic of discussion uh, at the Congress, and these different cells, these different patrullas, would discuss the same issue. So there'd be an articulation. Um, and that was really good, it was very encouraging. But the feeling that everybody had in, in my group uh, was that there wasn't any um, relationship there. There wasn't any um, linkage. Uh, because we weren't told what the Congress was discussing, what their conclusions were. And we didn't have any sensation that our conclusions or our opinions were getting channeled upward. So I think that's, that's an important um, mechanism to, to establish. OK. Uh, we'll just take a, a couple more, OK? Go ahead. And then I'll get Okay, my joke there as well. I, I wanted to make a comment. I was watching the movie. Then the movie was trade. trade. It was about uh, uh, human trafficking in, in, in uh, South and Central America. In this particular uh, movie, there was a scene where there was a kid from Mexico, his sister had been kidnapped and brought into America. Uh, and he met up with an American who, whose daughter had been kidnapped in Mexico. And the American brings him to America to help him look for his sister. This particular scene, the American had made mention about being an American. And the Mexican said to him, 
that Mexicans are American, that South and Central America is, Amer is the America as well. Yeah. And he had made emphasis that the Americans in their ego and arrogance and imperialism and uh, colonialistic idealism looks at those parts of America as nothing more than um, peasants. Uh, and I, I thought that was um, profound. And, and, you know, my comment is that uh, this individual who ran against Chavez, I've seen on CNN, he had made a, a, a comment that he was going to be leaning towards America and that he was going to, you know, a welcome the, um, that was one of his platforms, hurrah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would suggest, and throughout uh, South and Central America, socialism or what they call the leftist movement is, is, is somewhat of an a, a, a onslaught. Uh, they declare that uh, Obama is maintaining George Bush's, George Bush's uh, uh, same act. I, I would assume and suggest that it's going to come to a clash. Uh, I, 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 I suggest that, and I believe that it's, it, this, this is going to happen. And when it happens in time, might not there be a military parallel somewhere in that area where we might find ourselves in a conflict. And uh, if, 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 if this is the demand, from democracy here in America, uh, might not we be facing another uh, Vietnam, and um, uh, might that not that be a serious threat to to, to our border uh, with certainly. Mexico? Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you that uh, because I mean, our involvement in the Middle East uh, has a lot to do with the oil in the Middle East. Uh, we're intervening in countries uh, in situations that are not as bad, perhaps as situations in countries in Africa that don't have oil, we don't think of intervening because uh, they just don't have the, uh, the resources that uh, the Middle Eastern countries have. And so Venezuela is certainly vulnerable in that sense. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think that that is a possibility, is a, is a long-term possibility. I don't see it happening uh, in the short term. Uh, but things could certainly move in that direction. And I agree that um, uh, what Romney says is, is, is kind of frightening. This is not to uh, uh, encourage people to think in terms of voting for Obama, but uh, Romney criticized Obama for not being critical of Chavez. And he, Romney said that Chavez was a narco terrorist uh, and that the United, the United States cannot have maintain a neutral position. And uh, Obama kind of surprised me. His return statement was, we don't consider Chavez to be an immediate threat to the United States. Uh, so uh, th there is that difference, at least at the level of discourse, between, Ch between Obama and, and Romney. Um, what you said about the term America, um, I avoid using the term America. It's kind of difficult in Spanish. Because how do you call somebody from the United States? The term the United States in Spanish is Estados Unidos. But if you're talking about somebody from the United States, you have to say Estados Unidense, which is kind of a tongue twister. Uh, so it's not easy for me. Gringo's good. Gringo. I, I don't know if you say that. I don't know if you say that. Uh, I wouldn't say that in Mexico, but in Venezuela, I don't have any problem with that. Yankee, Yankee. And I'm a Yankee. I was born in New York City. <laughs> so, um, so I, I agree with that. That's, that's uh, an important uh, statement. You know, you don't hear Venezuelans now use the term Americano in reference to people from the United States like before. In the old days, mm -hmm. people would say that. And, and sometimes you'd hear somebody say, we're all Americano, mm -hmm. we're all Americans. But that was quite common. Nowadays, it's not nearly as common. Okay, just a couple more. Yeah. Either of you, Andrew or, or Brenda? You were the only la hands up. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I have a, I have a question. I was really interested to hear Otto right. So, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you because I <laughs> haven't gotten nearly such a nice narrative of the Chavez period from this media, that's for sure. But even when I'm reading other stuff. Just a quick, I saw um, Diana Negroponte, 
interviewed mm -hmm. as an expert on mm -hmm. Venezuela, who of course is married to John, and then I heard you say, I don't write. So, um, so I think that, that you're quite right in pointing out that this people being recycled <laughs> from the neocon period. But just a quick question. One of the interesting things is you said the style, you know, people here are just focusing on Chavez's style, on his performance, and they're not talking about these concrete actions that have happened. So here the style is used to discredit Chavez, right? He's a buffoon, he um, talks for hours on TV, he um, says things about North Korea that are quasi reprehensible and anti Semitism and these types of things. But what I'm curious about is what kind of style issues resonate with Venezuela and with this rank and file? I mean, does it do anything or are they only focused on the concrete actions or how is that interpreted in Venezuela versus here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, no, style is certainly important among Venezuelans and the polarization that exists in Venezuela with regard to things like expropriations, things like social programs, not, not so much with regard to social programs, but uh, with regard to a lot of Chavez's concrete actions and policies um, is also reflected in comments about his style. The Chavistas love his style and emphasize recently over the last couple, two, two years or so, they've emphasized uh, the term love. That Chavez is loving. Chavez mm -hmm. um, comprehends people, understands people, um, is broad-minded, whereas the opposition is um, uh, full of hate. Uh, and uh, so they make that, that distinction. If you speak to people in the opposition, uh, they, what they say is that, okay, we recognize that we have um, been very aggressively opposed to Chavez. We recognize that both sides are screaming at each other. But Chavez is the president, so it's his responsibility to change the tone, to reframe the issues, and uh, have things toned down. Uh, he, it's got to initiate with him. But you know, I, one thing I can say is that although there are Chavistas who are quite aggressive when they talk about the opposition, when they talk about politics, they're very forceful and everything else. Um, I don't hear the kind of language among the Chavistas. And like I said, I've you know gone gone into the barrios. I teach in the mission programs, and all the students come from the barrios. Um, and I speak to a lot of Chavistas, and I speak to people in the opposition. I, you hear people in the opposition all the time uh, talking about. Uh, wanting to kill Chavez. I mean, th that, that is a fairly common statement that you hear, and you've heard over an extended period of time. Uh, the only way to solve, you know, now that Chavez was reelected, people are probably saying, because I've heard this in the past, you know, let's face it, the only way we can solve this problem is killing Chavez. Um, that's the only way we'll get out of this mess. When, uh, out of coincidence, and I say coincidence because I'm not, I don't believe in any other explanation for these things, uh, during a period of about three years, there were maybe four or five important Chavez people who were killed, who, who died, uh, under different circumstances. Um, and the opposition were, were celebrated, they, they, they celebrated mm -hmm. that. They said, this is, this is God's will. I'm not saying the opposition, I'm saying people in the opposition. Uh, but it was fairly common to hear, I mean, you could hear people saying those things. I'm not talking about basket cases. I'm talking about people who you know, people who are <coughs> decent people, uh, but are talking along those lines. I don't hear the Chavistas using that kind of language. Um, so, uh, the, um, the discourse tends to be aggressive. Uh, but um, uh, what, what I find amazing is that what appeals, you know, the opposition criticizes the charge, but the fact of the matter is, if you analyze it um, from an objective viewpoint, what he's saying, his discourse, appeals to the rank and file of his movement. And it is repudiated, repudiated by the opposition. It, it's that much of a contrast. And just to give you one example, I remember when uh, the elections in 2000, 2000, the opposition candidate, who's now a Chavista, in fact, he's running for governor of Suvi, his name is Francisco Arias Cárdenas, and he was the second in command of the Chavez uprising in 
92. And he ran against Chavez. And his, uh, he, his campaign, he had a, a, a propaganda uh, and advertisement uh, that uh, used a symbol of a rooster um, and a cockfight. Uh, and he used that uh, uh, in his appeal to, to voters. And the middle class disliked that. The middle class people who supported him, I remember my sister-in-law, who's anti chavez said, you know, I hate that. Every time I see it on TV, I'm going to vote for him, because I hate Chavez also. But I hate that. Um, and I spoke to uh, somebody at the national level who was participating in the campaign of the opposition. And he said, look, you guys did uh, a, a propaganda piece that is really creating a lot of resentment among your, your own people. Uh, you probably don't know that, but I've talked to enough people to tell you that that's, that's happening. And he said, we know that's happening, but we do that on purpose. We know that a lot of people are opposing that, but we're doing that because that uh, rooster and the cockfight symbolizes um, cowardice. And we're saying that Chavez is a coward because on February 4th, 1992, when the Chavez uprising took place, Arias Cárdenas wanted to, con he, w he continued the fight. It was Chavez who called on his people to lay down their arms. So we thought a lot about that propaganda. It wasn't a casual kind of thing. We did it because before, when Arias Cárdenas went into the barrios, or our, when he went into the barrios, the Chavistas would, call, would say, traidor, um, a, a traitor. Because Arias Cárdenas had been a Chavista, and then he ran f a, as a, a candidate of the opposition. And so the Chavista people were calling him a traitor. But now our people uh, say, uh, you guys are cowards. So they're using that propaganda. They knew that the middle class was going to reject it. But they had a strategy that was appealing to the popular sectors of the population. And that's just an example of how discourse in Venezuela nowadays uh, is, very, is very specific in terms of who it appeals to and who it turns off. Okay, thank you very much. This is all very